Can thinking like a business be a good thing? Let's learn how to think outside the box with today's guest, Justin Rule. Hello, and welcome to Driven's Fundraising Superheroes Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Shashente, and if you're not familiar with Driven, you should be, because we are an all-in-one nonprofit software built from the ground up to help you and your team take hours of time, smash those duplication rates, and raise more funds. So our clients are really our partners, and we want to help them succeed by providing the easiest and most efficient software there is. Please give us a visit at trustdriven.com to learn more. So one of the most powerful skills anyone can have is to be a smart risk taker. When beginning a new adventure, both in the for-profit and non-profit sector, there are a ton of risks and uncertainties. You don't know if your organization will succeed or if you have the tools to meet your fundraising and strategic goals, along with so many other worries. You fall into a habit of doing what's safe because if you don't, there's a lot of unknowns. Justin Rule is a nonprofit leader and co-founder of Sparrow Designs. He felt similarly when he founded his organization Heads Up. After some creative risk taking, he found that it was when he began taking those risks that he reaped the biggest rewards. A solid strategic plan is nice, but Justin made his way into donors' hearts by spitting rhymes and keeping time to Will Smith's Miami. Great song. Uh, today's Justin is sharing his successes um, and how he got there on the show with us. So thank you so much, Justin, for joining me today. Absolutely. I'm so glad to be here. So when you um, started out as someone who has experienced working in both the nonprofit and for-profit sectors, uh, is there a big difference between the two? Have you been able to use your experience from one to build success in the other? It's a really good question. And they're different and they're similar, right? So. Um, I have definitely learned, I think the hard way, because given my early experiences, my early successful experiences, I should clarify, were more in the um, nonprofit world. What I was learning when I then came into the business world and as I'm juggling both those is that uh, the reasons why it took me longer to learn in the nonprofit sector was because I wasn't thinking of uh, the work I was doing like a business in the way that I serve people, in the way that I even strategize for my nonprofit. So it's been helpful, I think, is probably the best answer to have been in both worlds um, and realize that there are similarities um, just in the same way that a business owner like would, sit, would, would really have no problem saying, hey, if you want my service, it's cost this much money to, to work with me. What I've started to then learn is in the nonprofit sector, wait, I am offering a service and it does have a value to it that is actually monetary. And, uh, and so that really helped me change how I ask people to come alongside and support um, the nonprofit work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that mindset shift is um, something that when I started out with these uh, interviews, I, it took me a while. Because for me, like I pictured the traditional business model of, uh, goods exchange for money and it wasn't until my interview with Maeve um, who is a, uh, also a fundraising consultant um, that she's like no like you are offering a service it's a different type of service the exchange just makes the person feel good you're offering value so don't be afraid to make that ask yeah yeah it definitely helps you make the ask when you realize also a big difference is in, in that I found in the nonprofit sec sector largely um, at least in my experience we were asking for things that we planned to do and if we raise the funds we then could do whereas in the for-profit it's usually you, you've, you've done the work and then you're sort of sending the invoice and so that's a little different it's hard for um, maybe nonprofit leaders and, and even myself to understand um, how to juggle that because uh, the reality is in the nonprofit sector we know the work that we're doing to benefit our community has to be done and if we don't do it, like somebody else is going to do it. So you almost have to change how you, um, you almost like frame it like, hey, we're going to do this thing and you have a chance to be a part of it. We're, we're going to do it as opposed to please, 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 please give me money so that I can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of confidence has to go in when you're, when you're communicating your mission. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you start looking at your nonprofit as more of a business? Um, how did that help you in regards to fundraising and growth? So when I started, uh, I mean, I'll just, just be really candid. Like when we were 
doing our uh, building our nonprofit, we largely in the first few years relied on you know grants and um, you know foundation support and uh, that type of model, and um, and with that you're largely kind of beholding to those uh, requirements and regulations around how you spend those funds. You're kind of locked in, and that that limits a little bit just how fast you can grow, how far you can reach, because you can't really go outside of that box. Cause if you got funds to do X and you start doing Y, you, you understand, right? We understand that is how do we then uh, validate the use of those funds, right? All those beautiful things that nonprofit leaders have to balance. So when I started getting back into the um, for-profit business world, what I realized is that I needed to start, um, having more creative ways to fund the things we wanted to do to grow and expand. So one of the things we launched is we called it the 300 project. We had 300 families in the school we were working with and we started to rally donors around like when you support us, you're supporting a family. We need 300 supporters. And I think we asked them maybe for $10 a month. Um, but what that allowed is us to have supplemental funds outside of just the grant and foundation funds that we could then be flexible with and we could bring on a new staff member to start a new project or take an initiative just to do like a community mural, uh, you know, community beautification project um, because those funds weren't tied to a grant and didn't need to be justified. They came from outside. And so when I began to think, man, I, I would need to be flexible beyond what I just quote unquote wrote a grant for that for profit, like knowledge of, of how we can kind of get, other funds to do other things. When I brought that into the nonprofit world, it really opened my eyes to like, wait, wait, wait. If I can tell the right story and help people outside of a grant community or grant board understand what we're doing and see the value in it, now I have a lot more opportunity to, to do the work that needs to be done, not just the work that foundations believe need to be done. Mm -hmm. And creating such a strong group of monthly donors, it must be um, a really great feeling internally to see how many people support. And it always goes back to the storytelling, you know, how well you communicate your need, your mission, and connect with your audience. Yeah, and, and I, initially, I think, I was looking for a fewer donors to give larger funds. And I radically changed that, you know, I don't know, halfway into my nonprofit experience. It was like, no, no, no. I actually want a lot more people to know that their five or $10 a month that they can give me actually is affecting change in the community. And I really like talking to those people and making it really easy for them to say yes, as opposed to like, you know, sweating it out meetings with a big donor that you just might not say something right to. Right. Mm -hmm. So you um, have a lot of work with uh, charity organizations, and one of my favorite was when you parodied uh, Will Smith Miami. I watched the whole thing; it was that <laughs> good. Um, that was, I think, one of the best ways of storytelling because from that I understood what the organization was about. I got a sense of your personality, which is huge. So me wanting to be part of the community that you guys are setting, and I think it's something that a lot of nonprofits can learn from. So. How did that idea come to be? Why was it so successful? Uh, man, what's the truth? What are the true answers to those questions? Um, well, I had a moped, which you see in the video <laughs> at the beginning, and I was like, that was my daily driver to and from uh, the school. And um, way back in my whatever days, you know, I just, you know, love rapping, singing, whatever. And I absolutely can't dance, which the video proves. Um, but as I began to really like just hear what the students and teachers loved about themselves and their community, um, I can't actually pinpoint the exact reason why that particular song jumped into my head. Um, I, so it was, I'll give credit to a teacher or a student or something. But what I realized is I was tired of doing so much work um, in the traditional ways and trying to get it out, right? Like do all that work to hold an annual event and then try and share, you know, your passion with people. Um, when man, I think through like art, music, dance, like all these things that our organization was about, why don't we just use those means and actually empower the voices of students rather than me saying something um, and like tell their story. So 
uh, the students helped us like think of the words to the song. They helped us, you know, know what was nuanced about each grade and each teacher. And so it was at, the hardest part of that was actually talking teachers into being just like totally out there, getting out of their like, you know, they were afraid that their students would maybe take them less seriously when they saw them like dancing around. Um, and number two, uh, I mean, the kids were obviously cool with it. Um, it was like the, the process, helping people understand that that process was going to continue to be fruitful. And here's the crazy thing, Sabrina, they still play that song on the local kids radio station every Saturday when they play kids songs. It's still like, That's fantastic. it's bizarre, right? I mean, I don't even know, was that like eight years ago? Um, and you asked me like the impact that it had, the impact that it had is what you, what you just said. And it made it exciting for people to get involved. It showed that this school is doing things differently. These kids are different. These kids are talented. These kids like have a voice that needs to be heard in it. Man, it, I honestly, I feel like God blessed that way more than we ever, you know, could have done in our own human efforts. It was kind of a little special thing. Yeah. And I think that's, um, even if it's not in a music video, but just having the kids or the people that you're serving involved in that fundraising process, having them show in this case, you know, how much fun they have at the school, how connected they are to the community there, or just giving somebody else a chance to speak up and share their voice and their experiences um, goes back to that story. It really just drives the point home that you are doing great work. Yeah, it's a little more exciting than reading like a brief or a case statement about a nonprofit, right? Watching a YouTube. Well, always. A hundred percent would take a rap parody over a, a brief. <laughs> That's great. So right now, um, and for our viewers who are watching the video, they can see the beautiful Sparrow logo uh, behind Justin here. But not only did you co-found um, Sparrow Media, but you're working with ex-convicts to teach them skills in marketing and design. Um, I'd love to share more about that with our audience. So how did that program come to be and what came first, the business or the nonprofit? Oh, good question. Um, you know what, they, they, <laughs> as the chicken or the egg theory goes, they actually came at the same time. Um, I was working um, in my nonprofit and it and started a, um, a working for a for-profit as well. And I met another guy there named Adam and we realized our passion was for like nonprofits and startups and entrepreneurs. Um, but, and so we started to like think about, do we want to maybe launch our own business, you know, later to be known Sparrow. But at the time we were like, I don't just want to launch a business. I, my heart like beats for my city. And so how do I still do something that, is impactful and about that time you know the, the story is probably online somewhere but um, I came across a book by Calvin Coolidge uh, at a yard sale of all places and it was like a first edition 1924 book called the price of freedom and I I mean totally a, a godsend and I picked up this book and read this right in the middle of the book there's a uh, essay that Calvin Coolidge wrote who I mean shameful admission. I didn't even know he was a president when I picked up the book. Uh, for those in the States, they're probably gasping, but um, he, he wrote this essay called The Needs of Education. And, and it says, one of the things that jumped off the page, it said like, to truly empower someone, it's not just the intellectual empowerment, but it's the moral development of an individual too. And, you know, kudos to my parents, like growing up, uh, they both happen, uh, my mom's Canadian and just tossing that in there. But uh, the fun thing is like, <laughs> we, uh, I learned just watching them how to serve people that are not as you know, fortunate as us. Um, Ex-convicts, uh, homeless people were sitting in my, uh, sleeping in my basement all the time. And I realized that now as an adult that, man, they have some barriers to employment. They have barriers to, you know, there's just a ton of stuff we take for granted going in and out of buildings or homes in business that, they can't do. So Adam and I uh, really just stood over in this Coolidge mentality of training both the intellect and like the moral development of, of kind of the soul. And Coolidge Academy was born, that's what we called it. And the goal there is that we are doing what we know really well, which is digital media um, and design and teaching that to people who you don't need a college degree, you can very much apprentice, you know, whether it's social media marketing, whether it's content marketing or whether it's web design, those three fields are like brilliant 
uh, in terms of you're not doing anything that sort of infringes on or like the joke is this, when you build a website for somebody or pitch it to somebody, nobody says, Hmm, your websites look amazing, but let me ask you something, Justin, have you ever been in prison? That doesn't happen. Right. Conversely, if you're like, showing up to do service in someone's house. I mean, you have to have like quote unquote clean background checks or you can't really get hired by those companies. So um, that's sort of a long answer to what Coolidge Academy is, what we try and teach um, and how we try and empower uh, individuals, refugees and, and ex-convicts um, or people that couldn't afford college and are or maybe decided to prioritize raising children. Now they can actually learn some new things in a, an apprenticeship model. Um, and there's, there's a lot I could say about it. We, we were pretty intentional about different things we did, but I, I, I'm really finding life in that. And that's such a great way to approach um, reformation and giving back to the community because you're focusing on your company, which is, um, you know, helping people with their design needs, but then you're taking those skills and your knowledge and you're kind of um, bringing it back and you're getting people who don't have the same opportunities into the mainstream of um, career opportunities and all that stuff. So I think that that's a great approach and it's really weird to have this conversation with you because I literally just spoke with another gentleman and he was um, expressing the same thing. He's like more people should be taking their companies and looking at ways to give back than just starting a whole bunch of nonprofits. So I think that this kind of model really is going to be the future of the community. Yeah. I I would like to think that the world would be a better place if we did a little more apprenticeship, which is kind of what we used to do. Um, it's a little slower. You know, I can't serve 300 people at once. We take a few people through each year. We give out our tools and, and like, it's more, it's almost like, um, I don't even know what an example would be. It's almost like discipling someone as opposed to just teaching somebody knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little more messy, but, it's a lot more fruitful. Oh, a thousand percent. Um, you have such a diverse background of experiences, um, as we can tell from this interview, uh, from your business and charitable ventures, both successful and not. What was the biggest lesson you learned from it all? That's a great question, Sabrina. I mean, I feel like um, <laughs> what I've learned is God is bigger than my failures. Uh, and But I think if I were to sort of make it more palatable maybe to everyone, just depending on how they see or view the world around them. It's like, I've learned, and it's, it's cliche, but it's so important that my failures don't define who I am, neither do my successes define who I am. And, and that's kind of a, I think the first is, is easy, maybe for people like, I think I have five kids and if they, you know, playing soccer in the backyard and they try and kick a goal and, and miss or something. The, I mean, hopefully your kids don't go away and like, oh, I'm a failure. No, no, we like understand we, we tried and, and we just missed. And that's, you know, as we grow older, that, that's what we do. We, we try and miss, whether it's on a test or a business venture or, and, and we kind of, if we're, you know, mature, we can kind of understand that that, that failure didn't define me. I think what I've learned candidly the, the hard way or, you know, is when we let ourselves to, uh, begin to be defined by our successes, and we sort of like take credit and we become prideful and we become kind of these arrogant people that aren't really nice to be around because all we want to talk about is me. And that just, I don't know, people don't really like hanging around people like that. So I feel like I'm really um, learning to just be confident in who I am, not necessarily letting what I do define me, but knowing really who I am. Um, and out of that place, doing whatever kind of God gives me a chance to do that day, that year, uh, that venture. So that's, I think, what I've learned. Is that helpful? I think that's going to be a huge help for listeners. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for joining us today. For all of those listening, Justin and his team at Sparrow Websites have provided us with a free guide to building a website. It's filled with uh, obviously great information around constructing a website. Um, so definitely take advantage of that opportunity and link it in the description box on the Sparrow's own website. And if you're looking to keep updated on everything uh, driven with fundraising superheroes, give us a follow on Facebook and LinkedIn. Both of our socials are also linked in the description box, so you can check them out there, or you can search us up at Trust Driven. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Fundraising Superheroes.